Hi everybody, it is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our sixth unit on gene expression and regulation by discussing topic 6.2, which is on replication. All right, so before we get into gene expression and really how, do, how does um, DNA provide the instructions for cells to make proteins and thus produce their phenotype and their expressible traits, uh, we have to get into replication. Okay? And replication is really, really, really necessary when it comes to living things because in order for any kind of reproduction to occur, your DNA has to be copied. You have to make a copy of it so you can pass it on to uh, subsequent generations. That's true whether you're a uh, bacterial cell or if you're a mushroom or anything like that. Um, you need to replicate your DNA. Okay, so this, uh, this process is common among all living things as well. It's one of the things that really ties all living things together. Um, as, and as I said before, I believe in the last unit, every goal of every living thing is survive, to survive long enough to reproduce. Um, and in order to reproduce, you got to replicate. Okay, so um, replication ensures the continuity of hereditary information. All right, if you can't live forever, you pass down the instructions to make those complex molecules to your offspring. Okay, and nothing lives forever. So base pairing rules enable replication. What we talked about in our last video is that apple goes in the tree, car goes in the garage. That really enables replication. The fact that these base pairs are always paired together, no matter what, bar none, C to G, A to T, T to A, G to C, no matter what, that really allows for cells to replicate their DNA. And it's through what we call a semi-conservative process. DNA copies itself through a what we call a semi-conservative model, meaning that the two daughter molecules will have one old parental strand and one newly made strand. So let me move my face here. I'll show you what I'm looking at here. Okay, so when we think of replication of like say cells when they divide, okay, you have your, your original cell and then that cell makes a copy of itself. Okay, and that cell is kind of just like separated out from the old one, right? That's not how DNA replicates, right? So remember, we're in our S stage of our uh, cell cycle, okay? Yeah, Ugh, I had to think about it for a second. But this is, uh, this is what's going to happen during the S stage. We're making new copies of DNA. Uh, so check this out. This is a great picture of how semi-conservative replication works, okay? Uh, we have our original strand labeled in purple here, okay? And look, each of these two first-generation daughter strands of DNA, look, each one of them contains one of the old parental ones, okay? So each new strand is synthesized based on the base pairs from the old strand, okay? So, you know, if the old strand, this, uh, this left one has, goes A, T, C, okay? Then the new strand is going to go... A or a T A G, okay. So it's going to match up no matter what. Um, so each of these first generation strands, they have one of the original parent one, and then same thing over here. Each one of these strands conserves one of the original parent ones, okay. So that's what we call a semi-conservative model. And Watson and Crick, um, the two guys, well, with the help of a woman named Rosalind Franklin, who is also a genius. Um, the, the guys who really developed the model of what DNA looks like, they figured out, like, oh, yeah, since the, these pair up really well, this is probably how it's copied as well. Um, and they were right, turns out. We're going to look at an experiment later on in this class uh, that, um, that, show, that proves the semi-conservative model. Okay? And uh, this is how many scientists thought DNA was maybe copied itself, is through a conservative model, meaning that, you know, one strand or one set of DNA just makes a brand new copy of itself and then you know the old strand remains intact okay but that's not how it is okay if we were to take one strand from there one strand from there and then synthesize new strands based on the complements of the old strands that's semi-conservative and that's correct that's how dna replicates all right and this is just a preview of something that we're going to be looking at it's called the meselson stall experiment um, that really showed that it, it proved essentially that I always like to say science is an aim to prove, but this proved that DNA is replicated in a semi-conservative process, meaning that the new strand is always made from the old strand. Okay? 
so let's talk about how DNA replication works, and we're going to see that we're going to see this firsthand, the semi-conservative replication. Uh, something I want you to remember, though, uh, we're going to be drawing a picture down here. I'm going to be changing pic the picture. I'm going to be like adding things out, taking things in, you know, whatever. Um, but DNA is always conserved in the five prime to three prime direction, never the three prime to five prime. And I'm going to ask you to remember that because that's going to become very relevant. Um, in a little bit, all right? It's always five prime to three prime, never in three prime to five prime, all right? And remember, the five prime and three prime, those are just the terms that we use to orient DNA. It's based on the, the carbons in the pentose sugar of those nucleotides. Okay, so in order to replicate DNA, right, it is a double helix, okay? It's a double helix like this. It's a twisted ladder. In order to replicate it and get one new strand from the old strand, from the parental template strand, we have to unzip the double helix. This is gonna take a while for me to put back together, but that's okay. We have to unzip it, right? So that, oh gosh, <laughs> so that we have one strand, okay, with these nucleotides kind of exposed, okay? If I were to make a new strand here, I would have to match up, like, oh, this one's G, I'm gonna match it up with a C. A, I'm gonna match it up with a T. C, I'm gonna match it up with G. Okay, and so on and so forth. So this is what we call the template strand. And what I've uh, labeled as the template strands in this diagram are in blue. So these are the old ones, kind of like the picture that we just had before. Okay, uh, so in order for this to start, and I'm going to label these out, you know, in sequential order here. So step number one in DNA replication, I've got to move my strands. Um, an enzyme called helicase unzips the double helix like I just did. I just took it apart and opens up what we call a replication fork. Okay, so the fork is where, you know, these parental strands are separated out. And this yellow triangle over here, this is helicase. Helicase is separating out the parental strands from each other. Okay, uh, after that, a set of what we call single-strand binding proteins bind to the unpaired DNA strands, and they prevent repairing. Okay, so, you know, hydrogen bonds are bringing these nucleotide base pairs together. They're, they're being attracted to each other no matter what. Um, but we have to prevent that from happening. We have to prevent these two parental strands from repairing to each other because we got to make new strands, right? So that's what the job of these uh, single-strand binding proteins, that's what they do. And I've represented them with these little black dots over here. They kind of stabilize it and prevent the, the parental strands from repairing together. Okay, another enzyme um, that has an important job, it's called topoisomerase. Um, topoisomerase's job is to stabilize the double helix ahead of the replication fork and prevent super coiling. Okay, so, you know, DNA is coiled, right? It's a twisted ladder. And when you break it apart, it's going to uncoil it. Um, but what happens with that, if you uncoil it over here and you straighten it out, it's going to super coil. Um, that, that tension in the, uh, in the ladder is going to be maintained. Um, so it's going to super coil down here uh, where you don't see the replication fork. Right, so, so in order to prevent that from happening, Okay, we have an enzyme called topoisomerase, and its job is to stabilize, um, stabilize the DNA molecule ahead of the replication fork. So here's helicase splitting these up, causing problems, but topoisomerase kind of stabilizes it. Okay, so moving on from there, topoisomerase is represented by this blue blob, by the way. That's what enzymes really look like, so it's not that inaccurate. Anyway, um, in order to start this thing off, right, we got to make new strands. We got to make new strands based on the template ones. Um, primase, it's an enzyme that places a complementary little tiny strand of RNA, usually like 10 to 5, 5 to 10, maybe uh, base pairs long. Hey, it's called a primer. Um, it's made of RNA, and then you place it on the parental or the template strand that serves as a starting point for replication. Hey, we're going to see the action of a molecule called DNA polymerase, uh, in, just in, in just a second, but the, here's the thing about DNA polymerase. It can't start on its own. It, always, it only can build off something that's already there. It can only build off the strand that's already been placed. So in that job, it, it serves as the starting point for DNA polymerase. That job is done by primase and what we call these RNA primers. So I've represented primase with these red enzymes over here, and their job is to just drop a little bit of RNA that matches up with the parental strand to serve as a starting point for DNA polymerase. Okay, DNA polymerases, there's two that are involved here, DNA polymerase three and DNA polymerase one. All I'm asking you to know is that, you know, just DNA polymerase in this case, 
Um, synthesize new DNA by adding nucleotides to the end of the primer or the pre-existing chain. So bacterial uh, prokaryotes replication is just a little different, but we're going to stick with eukaryotes for right now. Um, but the, uh, the primer, as we said, serves as a starting point. And once that primer is placed by primase, um, DNA polymerase is able to make new nucleotides from where the primer is. Okay, so check out this picture. Look what happens. Okay, DNA polymerase goes down and uh, down towards the replication fork on this strand and away from the replication fork on this strand. Because remember, DNA polymerase, or it only works in the five prime to three prime direction, right? So check it out. Okay, we have, here's our five prime, there's our three prime. Okay, there we go. It only works in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, five prime to three prime, five prime to three prime. Okay, so there's DNA polymerase building off of the RNA. Great, we're done, right? We've copied our DNA and then, you know, it zips all back, back together and we got new molecules, right? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Okay, and here's why, okay? Since DNA replication only works in the five prime to three prime direction, okay, one of those strands has to work backwards. Okay, so let's go back to this picture really quick. Which one of these strands is working backwards? Okay. Now, I know this is a still image here, but we got to think about it as if it's, it's moving. Okay. Helicase doesn't just stop. Okay. It's just, it doesn't just stop and say, look, that's it. You know, that's, how much is, uh, that's how much is being replicated. Helicase is still moving in this direction, and it's kind of like following topoisomerase here. It's still moving, and it's, as it moves, it's going to unzip more and more and more and more DNA. Okay which means that more template strand is exposed. Okay, now think about this for a second. Okay, we got DNA polymerase in this, on this strand just following helicase. Okay, it's got one primer and it's just following helicase. It's going to make new DNA nucleotides all, all hunky-dory because it's following the helicase. This one is a little different. Okay, it has to work backwards. Helicase moves down uh, in the direction of the replication fork, making more template strand available, okay? But this one, it's working backwards. It has to go this way, which means it has to start over again and again and again and again. So that's what we call the lagging strand. And this picture is illustrating that um, one strand is able to, to produce, uh, produce a continuous strand because it's following the replication fork, but the other is not because, again, because it only works in the five prime to three prime direction, we have to go on the other strand, we have to go a little bit at a time, okay? As helicase unwinds more of the template strand, one of them has to work backwards, okay? A little bit at a time. So, the DNA strand elongating away from the replication fork is what we call the lagging strand, and it replicates in a three to five prime direction, one segment at a time. And it has to go five prime to three prime, that's the only way DNA polymerase works, but, has to do it a little bit at a time in order to make that new strand, okay? So imagine this, RNA places a primer, or excuse me, primase places a primer, uh, DNA polymerase makes a new strand, and then more helicase, or uh, excuse me, more template strand is exposed because of helicase. Have to do it again. Place another primer, make a strand. Place another primer, make another strand, okay? This one, it's not the case. It can just follow the helicase. All right, so these segments on what we call the lagging strand, um, the lagging strand because, you know, it has to work backwards all the time, those fragments are called Okazaki fragments, and they're about 100 to 200 nucleotides long. Okazaki fragments are so named because of the Japanese scientists who discovered them, all right? Um, so here I've kind of outlined the, these are kind of what Okazaki fragments are going to look like, and they have to be there in order for that lagging strand to even produce a new uh, DNA template strand. Okay, or excuse me, not a template strand, a new DNA strand. Okay, so the, uh, the strand that elongates towards the replication fork, it's called the leading strand. All right, it doesn't have to work backwards. It's working forwards in the direction of the replication fork. It continuously adds nucleotides and only needs one primer. Okay, so the leading strand only needs one primer, continuously works from five prime to three prime. The lagging strand needs multiple primers and makes those Okazaki fragments because it has to work backwards away from the replication fork. Okay, um, and finally, last step here, I should have labeled this like number, I think this would be number six, right? Number six, 
Yep. Ligase joins the sugar phosphate backbones of the Okazaki fragments into one continuous strand. Okay, so this green protein over here, um, it's called ligase. This is our last step of replication that we're going to discuss. Um, it takes these Okazaki fragments produced by the leading strand, and it makes them, ta-da, into one continuous strand. Okay, so there you go. That's how we replicate DNA. And as we can see from our process here, we have one old strand and one new strand. Um, so when this is wrapped up, okay, we're going to have two copies of DNA with one newly synthesized strand and one old strand. Semi-conservative process. All right, so here's the overview. Um, as we can see, there's helicase unwinding the DNA. Topoisomerase prevents the supercoiling. These single-strand binding proteins make sure they don't bind to each other. Okay. Here's our leading strand. DNA polymerase is doing its job, do, 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 making, new, uh, making the new strand in the direction of the replication fork. But here's the lagging strand going in the opposite direction, working backwards. There is DNA polymerase once again. Um, and what it has to do, it has to make a new primer, make a new strand, add a new primer, make a new strand. Okay, and here's our Okazaki fragments that we've been discussing as well. Okay, there you have it. That's DNA replication. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we will see you for topic 6.3.